All right, it's 10 o'clock. It's time for Long's Coffee Break. My name is John Stump. I'll be your host today. Also, my co-host is Pat Karras from Multistack, who's also on the call. So we very much appreciate you guys showing up and attending our coffee breaks. So with that today, we're gonna to go ahead and get started. Um, our topic today is gonna to be air-cooled heat pumps and heat recovery. With that whole concept of what's going on with the electrification in around the country and certainly uh, in the Colorado region as well. Uh, Boulder is definitely um, has a particular program and Denver just came out with a program called the Renewable Heating and Cooling Plan. Uh, that is available via a link that we've got here if necessary. So if you need that particular information or would like to review that information, reach out to one of your long sales uh, folks and they can send you over a link regarding that uh, plan from Denver. So we'll go ahead and get started a little bit. Um, so when we talk about heat recovery in general, what we really need to consider is load profile and how we can come up with a load profile that can simultaneously heat and cool is the ideal situation. So you're extracting heat from one location and, and uh, putting it into a space or vice versa. Um, when we can have those simultaneous loads, it makes perfect sense to have some form of heat recovery, um, either air-cooled or water-cooled products. If it's uneven, then we have to come up with some other mode, a sink, a geothermal, or something to that effect. We've got um, uh, two different main products. We've got the A series, which is an air-cooled product, and the M or uh, M series, which is our water-cooled <clears throat> but the air cool, the ARA uses ambient air, the VME is uh, in, utilized with geothermal or tower, and then our dedicated heat recovery chillers usually have, again, some form of heat sink or source. When we summarize basically what we're doing with multi-stack and heating, what our heating options are, we're going to concentrate today on just the two air cool products. There's the ARP, which is the air to water heat pump and then the ARA, which is our heat recovery. Uh, the MSR, MSH, and MSF, even though they are uh, very we're well suited and we've got some of those going on in projects here in Colorado now, uh, we're not gonna be talking about those particular products today. Uh, so with that, I wanna bring in our co-host, Pat, and I'm gonna have him kind of move into um, why air-cooled heat recovery. Great. Good morning, John. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the thank you for the introduction. We're uh, uh, this is the second coffee break that we've done, so uh, it's it's always nice to to get back with you folks. Um, the uh, the subject for today, as John alluded to, is is air source uh, heating options that MultiStack has available to us. The first one that we'll we'll talk about today is what we call ARP. Um, just a, a nomenclature thing for how multi-stack names things. Um, the, the A, if it's the first letter is an A, it's an air-cooled version. This, if the first letter is an M, it is a water-cooled version. So just sort of help you sort things out. Um, original days when we first design, started designing the modular product line, you know, we had a, a, a chiller, which was called an ASP, uh, and then an ARP was sort of the follow-on. Um, it was a heat pump machine basically think about if you have a heat pump on your home, we've, we've taken that version up to five tons or whatever you might have on your home. And we've said, let's, let's do something like that with an industrial or commercial application in mind. And so we do uh, a, a heat pump, an air cooled heat pump, anywhere from 20 to 60 tons in size. And then from there, you can obviously piece them together and, and all of a sudden very quickly have you know, a heat pump, an ARP unit that could be up to 14 modules times, you know, 60 tons if you were doing something that big. Pretty significant piece of equipment using, using that modular concept. Um, the ARP essentially has a, a refrigerant to water braze plate heat exchanger and a refrigerant to air coil. And so what you see in the picture is kind of what an ARP might look like. The real difference when we move to the air ARA would be kind of what's in the guts of the machine. We'll talk about that in a second. But one thing that we've developed over time, and we do it a little differently than the other folks do, is uh, it's underlined and bolded here. We also have the ability to do an integrated free cooling option. 
doesn't come automatically, but we, we like to think that, you know, Long will be very successful in promoting this integrated free cooling idea um, in not just Colorado, but perhaps, you know, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, the other three states that we're working with Long in. Um, what's different about how we do it is most folks that do integrated free cooling, um, they just do free cooling. They'll have a refrigerant slab, they'll have, you know, a water slab, and they're two separate slabs. In our case, we've actually taken the two uh, sets of, of tubes, put them all into one, one slab, if you will, and that is how we do integrated free cooling. So both, both slabs have the free cooling integrated to them, and we've been very successful with that. Um, as far as an example, just for the sake of an example, um, we've done some very large data center projects. We've, we've built 100 plus 350 ton machines air cooled with Danfoss turbo core, but it has the integrated free cooling coil in it. So um, that and, and heat recovery, not new to multi-stack, um, something we've been doing for quite some time. Customer base continue to say, all right, what else have you got for us? It'd be really nice if you did a machine that would do or, you know, heating or cooling or both. The ARP is one or the other. The ARA is actually, let's do both. Let's do, have the ability to do heating, let's have the ability to do cooling. And that's what this ARA machine, what you see actually on the picture is. It has a braised plate uh, heat exchanger for the evaporator, a separate one for the heat exchanger on the condenser side, and then the air to refrigerant coil um, as uh, and then condenser fans. And we use ECM fans. This machine is available today using 410A. Um, we won't dive into the refrigerant discussion, but but we're we're looking at that. But that's driven by the compressor manufacturers. But we're aware and we're thinking about what refrigerants are next. But today, 410A on the ARA machine. So that machine can do cooling only without heat recovery. It can do heating, air source heating, and then it can do simultaneous, uh, both heating and cooling, depending on the requirements of uh, as you drive the load pro profile. Um, Another interesting piece of this is if you happen to have a very cooling dominant load, you can take an ARA, combine it with an AR, uh, an ASP, a chiller, uh, you know, a cooling module, and actually satisfy a much larger cooling load by, by piecing these two together. Uh, so the ARA is a very flexible machine. Um, how long have we been doing it? More than six years um, in the field. It has been very popular from essentially British Columbia uh, and even Whistler, for those of you skiers out there, um, there's, a, there's an application up at Whistler, um, but also all the way down the coast, even now starting to drive into Southern California. Now we hope to be able to push this application uh, to the east into you know, Colorado, Nevada, Utah, et cetera. So how does it work? John, let's go to the next slide. Uh, it's a pretty simple version view, but you'll get the idea here. The one brace plate exchanger on this side handles the chilled water side and any remaining heat goes out through the condenser coils and then out through the fans. If we go to the next slide, that's cooling mode. Heating mode, just take the other brace plate heat exchanger, use that as the, the vehicle for, for moving that heat. Take the heat from the outside air that you need. If you don't use it all, that's fine. You just don't grab all of it. Um, and then work through the other brace plate exchanger heat exchanger. In the case where you have a simultaneous load, if it's a purely matched load, and John, let's go to the next one, purely matched load, uh, same size heating and cooling, you don't even have to necessarily worry about using the fans and the condenser coils and all of the heat exchange, the transfer happens um, in heat recovery mode between the hot water and the chilled water side evaporators. So um, pretty, uh, we think it's pretty elegant. Um, there are other people who, who do too. And so there's, we've got some competition out there, but we've been doing it for a very long time. Um, now, how do we, how do we manage the low ambient application or the low ambient conditions that we run into here in the mountain regions? Yep. Like what's our, what's our minimums that you run into? Yeah, perfect. Great question, John. So um, we learned a lot of lessons in our six or seven years of, of launching this. And one of them is that um, you know, it wasn't necessarily rocket science, but it was one of those things you didn't think about early. And we realized over time that um, as the ambient changes, your ability, as it goes down, your ability to produce that same level of hot water 
um, also falls. And so in, you know, in Colorado environments and, and why we're excited about what the future brings, um, you guys get some really cold temperatures where, you know, Pacific Northwest, not so much. And so um, the, the maximum as you get down into the under 20, 15, we get challenged, quite frankly, to do more than about 110 degrees. And we have developed a hot water setback. And so the question becomes, you know, is that hot enough? Because a lot of times people want you know, 180 degree hot water. Well, do you really need 180 or do you really need 140 or whatever? Um, and could you supplement it or are people okay with 110 degrees? But we've been very, you know, we learned those lessons. We've developed ways to deal with that with the ARA product line. If you don't need 130 all the time when the ambient falls, there's a way to get there with, with this machine. Um, but along those lines, we said, hold on, we've got to do something better for, you know, the more inland areas, you know, the Montana's, Wyoming's and Colorado's and Utah's were it's regularly zero degrees. And so um, in this case, the, you know, the design ambient with this new machine, it's an ARA, but it's different. Um, the design temperatures are 145 degrees. As the ambient falls, um, what we've, we've um, developed is using a new compressor, a different compressor from Danfoss. Um, and it only one of the challenges now is it only comes in 15 tons. We put two of them together in tandem. So our, our module is a single circuit of machine, 30 tons, two 15 tonners. But now we can go all the way down to zero degrees and still produce you know, 130 to 135 degrees. And we're really excited about this. We've got lots of them uh, on tap to, to be sold. They're already specified and we're building them um, in the factory. And it's, it's really a, a unique uh, next generation of, of product development. So. Uh, we're excited about that. We're pushing Danfoss and Copeland because Copeland has been our manufacturer that they just didn't have a product line, but we're pushing them to give us a, a 20 ton compressor and a 30 and a 40 because what this refrigerant injection does is it goes into the top cap of the scroll set and it allows the envelope to expand. Basically uh, think of it as motor cooling uh, because that was the limitation with a fixed speed original generation uh, scroll was uh, they just couldn't handle the temperatures and they were shutting themselves off rightly so to try and protect themselves so so we're really excited about the potential development we've already like i said we've got a lot of folks looking at the ara 30l which is the simultaneous module and 30 uh, arp 30l so lots of Lots of good development and growth, and, and we hope that uh, the, the folks in Colorado and, and the rest of Long's territory will, will start to, to grab it and run with it. Um, but, um, and we've also addressed the defrost cycle because as you work through these different changes in application, there will be a requirement uh, generally to, to, to do a defrost sequence. And that's something that is you know, a conversation uh, for another day. But I think the last slide we have here, John, just sort of says, how does this work? This is what the scroll cutaway would look like. The most important piece on here is the yellow highlighted section, which says, hey, this is how this works. It's already pre-assembled in the field. It's already controlled by our Corel platform. So there's nothing magical that has to be done by the customer. It's already ready to go. And we essentially inject uh, refrigerant into the upper cavity of the scroll set flashes off, but it allows you to get to those those extreme types of, of conditions. So uh, we're working towards we're we're at zero, and uh, if the technology continues to improve, who knows how much lower we could get? But we're we're comfortable at zero right now, and, and 130 35 degree hot water in those I'll call them extreme conditions. I grew up in Wisconsin, so you know nothing scares me. But so Thank so John, that's um. That's kind of a, a quick tour. Anything else or questions or anything to add? No, I uh, appreciate it, Pat. I, I wanted to let everybody know that, you know, Multistack is a relatively newer line for us in the past year and a half. We partnered up with them and it's been fantastic to work with these guys. Uh, they build some certain pots and, uh, spots in our line card that we didn't have before. So we're very grateful to have them as a manufacturer. So with that, I want to, uh, kind of lead into our open house. Uh, we're having an open house on July 29th. Uh, it's gonna be all day, it's a Thursday. So make sure Liberty registers, uh, pass this around your office, uh, make sure and come out. We're gonna have a, it's a downloadable app. You can get a, a 
entry um, ticket. And then there's gonna be a bunch of other information that we're gonna pass along through this application as well. Um, so we hope for you guys to join us. Uh, also next week's coffee break is gonna be a presentation by Matt Bilsma. Um, he's gonna be talking about uh, Denver Energy Codes with the path to electrification uh, with his co-host as well. So again, thanks everybody for attending the uh, long coffee break. We appreciate you guys um, coming in and, and joining us and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you.